let's uh, start. So, um, just to make one uh, point, uh, yeah, are, are there any questions, comments, suggestions, anything? Like one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, you might wonder like, hey, you know, I did quiz one and there were questions and uh, I didn't get a perfect score and you might wonder like, what did I do wrong, yeah? The same as with quiz two, with exam one and exam two next week, is that you can always, I can show some of the things here in class Okay, but you can always go to the TA. The reason that we do not distribute these quizzes and exams is that we also give the class next year. And we already have to make five copies of the quiz, of one quiz, of one exam, and that just takes a lot of time. Okay, for those that did quiz one to, uh, quiz two today, they have noticed that there was an error in one of the questions and that those are very easily made, believe it or not, that there was something is unclear in the writing or something else. So it takes a lot of time to make five of those quizzes, five exams at that three times and that's why we don't openly distribute them among the students and hey, here, is the, here are the exams, here are the quiz results, just check it out at home yourself. <laughs> If you have questions, the TAs will go over you, over the questions will you, okay, with you, okay? So the same as with the exam, please be quiet in the back because it's a little disturbing here up front, okay? So, so you can go to the TAs and you can ask them the questions or you can come to me and we can show the results. But the thing is, please understand, again, we can't distribute all these quizzes because we have to make five copies for each exam, each quiz, and then once they are used by the students, they're being copied for next year and to come each time up with 50 new questions is not so easy, okay? We can change some numbers, that is relatively easy, but to come up with completely new things is not so easy. So please talk to the TA or talk to me if you have specific questions that you wonder, what did I do wrong? I only see a final number here and I like to know which question I did wrong and why, okay? So we will talk today and Wednesday and Friday can we'll have a review uh, uh, section about chapter 8. Chapter 8 and chapter 9 are very similar in some sense. And essentially chapter 8 covers three different methods to solve a system of equations. And I will, I will go over these three methods. The question is always, da, why do we cover three different methods to get the same answer? That's a good question, okay? So what's most important is Gaussian elimination, okay? Keep that in mind. And that's the first method that we'll talk about it in class today. And on Friday, we will actually go over a bunch of examples that you might expect next week in exam two. <coughs> So if you understand those, so if you understand the script of Friday, you should be doing okay in the second exam next week. Okay? Now, so solving systems of equations. So let's, let's what, what, what is a system of equations? So we'll first start again with clearing the memory, yeah? And I'll just empty the screen for you, so you can see what's going on, yeah? So we are all the way up there now. So here I summarized the things that we're going to do, and here on top you see what the goals are of each lecture, yeah? The number of the points that are being made, what, what we expect you to know somehow. Now, imagine that we have done some experiment in the lab. And this can be any experiment. We're, do, we're an engineer or we're a scientist and we're doing some experiment. And we have measured the flow rate of water through a pipe system as function of the drop in pressure between the left side and the right side of the pipe. Okay, so what we have done is we have measured three pairs. So we have measured the flow rate and the corresponding drop in pressure between the left and right hand side of the pipe. Now, with the flow rate of 1 e minus 4, Q, that's my flow rate, the pressure drop is 115 meters, I guess, the units. With the flow rate of 8 e minus 4, it's 110, and with the flow rate of 1.4 e minus 3, so these are relatively small flow rates given the units, is 92.5. 
So now what we have is we have three different values of Q, three different flow rates, and we have the corresponding pressure drops, H. So this was measured in the lab. In principle, you could also do this in the field, yeah? But I'm not a uh, structural engineer or so. Anyway, so what we do is we just copy-paste this in MATLAB. And as you know, if you have this in a text file, you can also load the text file into MATLAB. For instance, you work in Excel, you have a bunch of data in Excel, and you just can save that as a text file, and then with the load statement here, yeah, you can load it directly into MATLAB. But what we do for convenience, we just copy-paste here from the lecture script. Now, the first thing that I want to see is what is this relationship? I now have some numbers, I have Q and H. So I like to see how, how, how does this look? And of course we add some labels to this and we define the axis limits here. And we have the head and the flow rate. So the flow rate is in cubic meters per second. That's on the X axis and on the Y axis we have the head. Now we are a scientist or an engineer. This is more of an engineering problem because we typically, we know most of the things, yeah? So, and now someone asks you, okay, you know, fantastic, but I want to know what's the head drop at the flow rate of 0.5 cubic meters per second. So we have three measurements of the flow rate and we have three corresponding head difference and head drop, yeah? But now the question is, can you tell me what the head difference is with the flow rate of 0.5? And we didn't do a measurement with the flow rate of 0.5. So how do we solve this problem academically correct, more or less, yeah? Now what you can say is you can interpolate. You can say I know the value here, I know the value here. If I just connect them with a straight line, yeah, like this. Then I can interpolate what the value should be around 0.5. So that's around, what is it, like uh, 112 or so, 113 meters? Now, that is the easy way, yeah? It's possible. But we can do it a little nicer if we define a certain function. We can fit a function through these three data points. So we can define a mathematical function that says x is q, and based on Q, we predict Y, and that is H in this case, the head. So we can define a function. So that's what we do now, we define a function. And imagine that this function looks like this. So the head difference, the head drop H, is C1 is a coefficient we don't know, which is also called a parameter times the flow rate squared plus another coefficient times the flow rate plus a third coefficient. And if you remember well, in chapter two, the function polyfall, polynomial evaluation, is a similar polynomial, yeah? That is something to the power n, then something to the power n minus one, and then a coefficient at the end. So we have cn times Q to the power n, etc., all the way to Cn plus 1. Now, so this is the model that we like to fit through the data. So what do we have? We have three values of Q and we have three corresponding values of H. So we then have three equations with three unknowns in principle, because we need to know C1, C2, and C3. These are three coefficients, <coughs> also called parameters. Now, how do we solve this? The book gives a recipe and says you undertake these four steps. The first step you do is write the equation out in natural form. Now, we have that on line 64. The second step is identify the unknowns and order them. Then the third step is isolate the unknowns. And the last step is write the equation in matrix form, or which is similar to this, A times x is b, and x is not the x-axis or so, x the book considers to be the unknown coefficients. I would have called them c perhaps, a times c is b, but the book calls it x, and x are the unknown coefficients. So what we end up with at the end is that we know a, we know b, 
and now we need to estimate x. We know A, we don't know x, and we know B. So this is a matrix calculation. This is a vector, this is a matrix, so matrix times vector is A, becomes a vector if you want, if you do that. So step one, write the equation in natural form. Now, I will move it up a little bit, it's easier yeah, to see here. Line 74, this is our equation. So again, the head difference, H, that's what we had on the y-axis of the plot, is equal to an unknown, C1, coefficient 1, times the flow rate squared, Q is the flow rate, plus another coefficient, C2, times the flow rate, plus a third coefficient. So I, I have three values of Q and three corresponding values of H, and so I have three equations with three unknowns. So how do we set up that system of equations A times X is B? Because then we can solve for X in MATLAB. Now, what are the unknowns? Line 75 are C1, C2 and C3. So we have three unknowns. Now, now we can isolate those unknowns and we can order them in a vector X. So our vector X is C1, C2, C3. For instance, and you can, uh, I, I leave this out because it doesn't matter. So we have three unknowns here, yeah? And they're in a vector now. Okay. Now the last step is step four. Now write the equation in matrix form. Now the matrix form is A times X is B. So how do we do this? How, what, what does A look like? So somehow we need to do a multiplication that if we have a certain matrix A here on this line here, you see them over here, yeah? And we multiply that with X, it's probably vertical, we get B. So how do we do this? How do we set up A? Now, let's look at our equation. So we have C1 times Q squared plus C2 times Q plus C3. If I take C1, C2 and C3 out, what I have left is Q squared. I have left Q and I have left something that if I multiply that with, I get C3 and that will be 1. And that's what you see here. If I set up A, what I'm going to get is the first row of A will be my first measurement of Q squared, then my first measurement of Q and then the 1. So if I multiply this with my vector C1, C2 and C3, which is vertical, then you get an in product of two vectors. This is horizontal times C1, C2, C3 is vertical. I get an in product and that should be equal to B, B1, which is H1. Okay, so that's what you see here, H1. So if I multiply this one with this one, then you have an in product because this is horizontal, this is vertical, yeah, and that gives us H1. So essentially what you have is that equation back on line 74. Now, I have three sets of measurements, so what I do is I add another row, but now not my first measurement, but my second measurement squared, then my second measurement, and then one, so that the multiplication ends up with C3. If I put a zero here, then suddenly I have 0 times C3, I only have two coefficients in my equation. Now, and then I have a third row in A, and that is my third measurement squared, my third measurement, and then 1. So if I multiply this third row with a vertical vector, I'm going to end up with my third head measurement. So now what I have is I've, I have A, my matrix A, I have a vector here X, and I have a vector B. So if I multiply these two, to, uh, these two, I should end up with this. So now I know, in principle, I know all these values here. I know all of them, because I've measured them. So A is known. My matrix A is known. This, these values are not known. These are the ones that we're trying to estimate, so that our function nicely goes through the data. And these are our measured head values corresponding to our flow rates, Q1, Q2, and Q3. Now, <clears throat> I wrote this out here for you, okay, just to, to check it again. So this first row 
of A times this vertical vector, this, is, this gives us, and this is an inner product, yeah, is equal to H1, first measurement. Here, second row of A times our coefficient C1, C2, C3 is another in, inner product, gives us second head measurement. Here, third row of A times, again, the coefficient is another inner product, is the third head measurement. So if you write this out, then you're going to end up with, with this, yeah? If you, if you write this out, you're going to end up with Q2 squared times C1 plus the second Q measurement times C2 plus 1 times C3 is equal to H2. And this is, again, this is our original equation for the second measurement. This is our original equation for the, first, uh, for the third measurement. And then you have one for the first, this low, yeah? This is for the first measurement. Now, now we can fill out the values. We just fill out these values in our matrix, yeah? So what we do here is I have our first measured Q value here was 1E minus 4. So what I do here, I fill out that value and it says that I need to square it. So that's what I do. Then I have 1E minus 4, Q1, and then 1. Second row is my second measurement of Q is 8e minus 4, and that's what you see, 8e minus 4. So semicolon means go to the next line, yeah? So this is 8e minus 4 squared, 8e minus 4, 1. This is my third measurement of Q. If I go to Q3, what's my third measurement? It's 1.4e minus 3. So squared, 1e, 1.4e minus 3, and then 1. So now I can just fill this, and I have my A matrix. So this is my A matrix which is known. Everything in here is known. <coughs> then my measurements H were 115, 110, and 92.5. Now those measurements now become a vector B. Yeah, we have A times X is B, and B are our head measurements, H. So this, again, is a vertical vector. So we get the matrix times a vertical vector gives us a vertical vector. Does that make sense? Look at, look at matrix vector multiplication, and you'll figure that out, those rules. Now, so now what we are left with is we have A and we have B. And so there's something A, and we multiply that with C1, C2, C3, and that should give us these values. Now the question is, how do I solve this system of equations? I've set it up. So we made a big step forward, and now the question is left, is okay, now I like to know to solve for x, the coefficient c1, c2, and c3. How do I do that? Now, that's where Gaussian elimination comes in, but let's first look at the equation. So this is the equation we like to solve. Yeah, and somehow we like to isolate x. We like to have a forward expression for x. x is this times that, ideally instead of a times x. We like the a to go to the other side. Now, one way to do that is you can move this one to the other side, yeah? And so that's the same as this expression. x is the inverse of a, something, 1 over a or so, times b, yeah? So you can go to page 396 of the book, yeah? So this is a summary of everything... Uh, in the book. So, but this one, now we need to compute this one. So now we have a solution for x, is a is some, something like the inverse of a times b. That's the solution for x. But we need to compute the inverse of a. So how do we do that? Now, in MATLAB that's easy, because MATLAB has a function inverse a. This is the inverse of a. Yeah? Now that's fantastic, but the inverse only works if A is a square matrix. So you can use this solution, but it's not ideal. So what it said here is that this is the same as X is the inverse of A times B. So if you do inverse of A times B, then this is our solution of our coefficients. Yeah? So it does exactly what, the one, what we wanted. Our first coefficient is really, really small, but large, yeah? like minus 1.6941 times 10 to the power 7. 
Our second coefficient is much, much smaller than this. And our third coefficient appears zero, but that's not true because this number is so large. The first one, we can just ask each, uh, so if I say x is the inverse of a, so then I have x1. You see x1 is really large, but really small. And then here, this is also quite large, and x3 is still, the third coefficient is still 115. It appears zero this way, but because it says here 10 to the power 7, okay? So always look. Never look at this, make sure that you have the right quantity there on top, yeah? Okay. So now we have our solution here. So these are our coefficients. Coefficient, this is coefficient 1, this is coefficient 2, and this is coefficient 3. Because the coefficients, again, is the, infer the, 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 the equation that we had was a times x is b. So we need to isolate x, so we need to move a to the other side, and we do that by just moving it to the other side, so we're going to get the inverse of a. Yeah, because we know that a times the inverse of a is the identity matrix, yeah? So if, if, it's, still not, if it's not clear to you, we have this equation, yeah, a times x is b, so if we multiply both sides with the inverse of a, then you're going to get a times the inverse of a times x, is the inverse of a times b, or the inverse of a times a times x is the inverse of a times b. Now, inverse of a times a is the identity, so we're going to get x is inverse a times b. Now, let's now look at this function. We have our coefficient now. Now, let's plot this in a figure. So, what I first create is I create a hundred flow values, q figure. This is to, to, uh, uh, to create the figure, so I create 100 flow values between 0 and 1.5 e minus 3 cubic meters per second. Now I fill out my equation, yeah? This is my equation was my first coefficient times the flow rate squared plus my second coefficient times the flow rate plus my third coefficient. Now we now know what is x1, x2, x3 because we solve for the unknowns. Now, I have created 100 values, so I can nicely do this. And again, here the dot is required because we do a vector calculation here. And we know that a scalar times a vector, we don't need the dot. You can include the dot, and it's the same here. A scalar times a vector squared. We can include the dot, but it's not necessary because with the scalar, you don't need to use that. Now, we plot this, and this is how it looks. Yeah, so what you see is that our equation appears to go perfectly through the data. So the coefficients that we found perfectly fit the data. So this is a test whether our fitting went okay. And what you see that apparently it went really well because now we go perfectly through the data. And now I can answer the question, what's the value at point 0.5? If I want to know the value at point 0.5, I just fill in like uh, a Q and then I uh, Q uh, point, uh, five or so, whatever is, or the H.5, yeah, it's called, H.5 is X1 times, now we need to make this point 0.5, and we square this number, plus point 0.5 and plus X3. Uh, is this right? X1. Uh, let's see. Oh, I need to go much smaller. That's E minus 3, yeah? What are the units here? E minus. Yeah. So it's 114.1758. That is the solution at this. And what you see here is that it's higher than if you would linearly interpolate because you would go like if you linearly insert a line or so, yeah, we'll insert that. So you see that you get a different solution, okay? If I would have linearly interpolated, I would have given a value of, of around here. Whereas our solution says the answer is about 114.1758, okay? So this ID idea of a times x is b, you can apply that to many different problems. But the problem is, is that the way we got the solution here with the inverse of a is not ideal. And why? If a is not a square matrix, 
which means the number of rows and the number of columns in A are identical, then you cannot compute the inverse of a matrix. The inverse of a matrix you can only calculate if the matrix is square. Now, and A in this case is square, so that's why I use it, yeah, it's very convenient. Because you will probably follow this, you just need to move A over to the other side to get X. Now, that's what we did, and then we need the inverse of that. But it's not ideal, so we wouldn't suggest this, and that's what we write out here, that if you use the inverse of A for a matrix that is not square, so A is not square, that means you're going to get a warning, and MATLAB is going to say, I cannot do this for you. It says the matrix must be square, and what square means, a square matrix is a matrix with the same number of rows as the number of columns. Now in our case, you see that A was three rows, three columns, yeah? So this is square, and that's why it will work. Now, the book gives a way better solution, and I strongly recommend that you use that, forget about the inverse, but it's just to make the story flow, yeah? From one to the other, yeah? So you, you need somehow a solution, a direct solution for X, and you have A and B. You set up A and B, and now you need a solution for, uh, for X. Now what you can do is use the backslash operator in MATLAB. Okay, so MATLAB has a special routine, the backslash operator, which essentially does Gaussian elimination for you. It's completely built in. And why would you recommend using that backslash operator? Because if you have, let's say that you have an equation with 100 unknowns and you have 10,000 data values, yeah? So you need to compute the inverse of a really large matrix. And uh, first of all, it needs to be square. So that one is not square. The numbers that I just gave you will not result in a square matrix. So that's not going to work anyway. But the backslash operator is very efficient. Now, what does this essentially mean? That you multiply A on the left side, by, or you multiply, the, you multiply B on the left side with the inverse of A. That's what this backslash operator means, and it's Gaussian elimination. So this is important, and what you see here is that you get the same solution here as if I did this one. You see the values are the same. But again, the inverse of A is only possible if the matrix A is squared. And it's not as efficient. This is the most efficient solution, which means that for the computer it takes the least amount of time to compute. And that's the backslash operator, Gaussian elimination. Now, let's look at another example. Imagine that we have, forget about the flow rate, it's just one example. You're going to get difference of these are different examples on exam two. To, you can apply this, okay? So imagine that we have collected x versus y. x and y could be anything. Y is the number of uh, drinks in the bar versus X is the uh, yeah, number of times that you received an F. I don't know. <laughs> but that's unlikely, yeah? Because then the more Fs you received, likely the more Y, yeah? And here it's the other way around. So this student is a really serious student. Yeah, you don't see them often, but okay, very good. X and Y. So we, we define X and Y, okay? So I just collect the data here, x, so we go, let's clear this entire thing, uh, clear it all, see, we'll, see, we'll start it over, we have a new, uh, so these are our x values and these are our y values. Now we can plot this data, so we clear the plot here, CLF means clear figure, so then there's no figure anymore, so now uh, the figure is empty, and now I plot these values, x versus y, these are the data I collected. Okay, now use the x, I define appropriate axis now between 0 and 4 and 0 and 3. So now you see the three data points here, yeah? Now you look at this data and somehow you figure out, you know what? I look at this data, it's not perfectly linear, but let's fit a linear line through this data because it's easy. You might think it's easier. <laughs> now, because you can see that if you fit the linear line, there's no way that you can fit all the three data points perfectly, yeah? I hope you agree with me there. At least I don't see it. Like we can fit it linearly through these two, but then we underestimate this one. Or we can fit these two perfectly, but then we underestimate that one. 
So, and we can fit from here to here, but then we overestimate this one. The line will go higher than this data point. So there's no way that the linear line, unless you use two different segments, yeah, like a spline approach or so. But we define this as our model, yeah? Straight line. So the y that we predict is alpha unknown parameter times x plus beta, yeah? And alpha and beta are two unknowns. So we have now two parameters, two coefficients, and we have three data pairs. We have x is 1, y is 2, x is 2, y is 1, x is 3, y is 0.5. So we have three data pairs and we have two parameters, alpha and beta, okay? So we follow, again, uh, we write the equation, and this is the equation, alpha and beta are the unknowns. We define that the coefficients x or c is alpha and beta, and that's vertical factor, that's why the prime, uh, uh, transpose uh, prime is there. And now we need to set up A and B. Now, B are simply our measured values, our Y values, yeah? That should be evident, yeah? Like the, the, uh, the last time, B were our measured head values, Y values. So we have B. B is simply this value, that value, and that value, or this value, that value, and that value. The order doesn't matter. If you do the, you, you just need to make sure that you do the order on the x correct then, yeah? Now, what are our a values? Now, if you look at our equation, alpha plus beta, alpha times x plus beta. So we need, we need some matrix A times alpha and beta is going to give us 2, 1, and 0 0.5, measured y values. Okay, so how does that matrix A look like? Now, we, we wrote it out here. It's, this is how uh, you can look at it. You write the three equations out. So alpha times x. Now, the first x value was, if you go back to the figure, is the figure still, yeah? The first x value was 1. The second x value was 2. And the third x value was 3, to make it easy. Now, so what we have essentially is 1 times alpha plus 1 times beta, yeah, is B1. That's the first row of A. Second row will be X times alpha, and X is 2, 2 times alpha, plus 1 times beta is second Y value, B2. Then the third X value is 3 times alpha plus 1 times beta is B3. So what are now... The, what's now the A matrix? That's 1, 2, 3, and 1, 1, 1. And that's what you see here. A is this matrix here. Yeah, so 1, 2, 3 for our x values, and 1, 1, 1 to make sure that beta appears in our equation. Because otherwise, we, if we don't have this, and these are zeros, then we're going to get x times alpha plus zero times beta. So we need beta in there, so that's where the one appears in A. So now what we have, we have our A and B values. Yeah, so now the same problem is, we unfortunately, can we compute the inverse of A? Does that work? I heard yes and no. So what's the answer? Is this, uh, just to help you a little bit, is this matrix square A? So what did I try to say in my own language, Dutch, but I hope it came across that the matrix needs to be square, yeah, for the inverse to be there, yeah? So this matrix is not square A. You see there on top, it's not square. So the inverse of A is going to give a warning. So now we're stuck. We're like, oh my god, this is the only solution I know. So that's why Gaussian elimination is really useful. If you do this, we have A and B, so these are our coefficients. This is my alpha, 0.75, and this is my beta. Does it make sense that alpha is negative? It's alpha times x, so does it make sense that alpha is negative? We concluded that this was a really good student. He received two times an F or so, yeah? And drank very little. Yeah, so very good. So that means that the more Fs this student receives, the less he drinks. So there's a negative relationship between the two. Yeah, yeah, it's remarkable, but uh, it still happens. So it makes sense that A is negative, of alpha is negative. And beta is a positive value, and why? Now, yeah, we can show that beta is the intercept, yeah? 
This is the intercept, the location that we cross the y-axis. Now, if you look at this plot, if you fit a linear line through this, you cross probably the y-axis somewhere here. Now, and that makes sense. Our value is 2.67. Now, yeah, that is somewhere here. That makes sense. And then A, the, uh, the slope is negative, so that means we're going down instead of going up like this. Now, we plot this function. So I call this, in this case, let's call them C. Yeah, same answer. Now, we plot this function. And now what you have is this is our solution. This is our fit through this to these data points. So what you're going to do on exam two is you're just going to get some data, x versus y, or temperature versus something else, or whatever, and you're going to get the function, and you're just going to set up a and b, and you solve for the unknowns, you plot the function, and that's a large part of research that I actually do with students, is that we have data sets, all kind of data sets, could be all in different fields, and we have a model of that system, and we try to make the model so that it fits the data really well as possible, and then we use that model for forecasting, for instance, or understanding of a system. But what you see here is a nice example is that our linear model does not perfectly fit the data. Okay, ideally you perfectly go through each data point. That means you have the perfect model. That's what we had in the other example. Likely, if I use a polynomial function here, I will perfectly go through the data. Yeah, I just need to, or, or I need to use a slightly more complex function, not a linear function. But there's a nice thing here, where this dates back to the rank function that we used. There's a difference here. In this case, this system of equations is called inconsistent. And that essentially means that you do not perfectly fit the data. Whereas if you perfectly fit the data, it's called consistent. And how, do we, how does this relate to rank? We first calculate, uh, <coughs> you see here, that there's a residual. We call this residual, okay? And this is important. We'll get back to this. What is y? What is y predict? Oh, let's see here. What do I do, do wrong? What are my x values? Oh, yeah, of course. <coughs> so I need to go back. Um, let's see. A. So we have a residual left, and this is, so if I predict, I have my predicted y values, and I had my observed y values, and what you see if there's a difference between the two, yeah? This is not zero, which means that my model here and my data point are not identical. You see that my model, if I do the measured minus the model, then the measured is a little higher than my model, and you see that this residual, that there's a positive residual. This is not zero, this distance. This is positive. Here you see that the residual is somewhat negative. You see that the <coughs> data point, y, is lower than the simulation. So this is negative, because this is smaller than, the observation is smaller than this one. And here's the other way around. So this is what we call the residual. So the coefficients that we cut, alpha and beta, make this residual s as small as possible. Yeah, that's what Gaussian elimination does. In some sense, those residuals are made as small as possible. So we're looking for those coefficients that ideally have a zero residual. But in this case, unlike the first example, in this case we do have a residual left. So we do not perfectly fit the data. And that's what's called inconsistent, and you can directly figure it out without having to plot all this, and that's by using the rank function. If we go back to A, this was A, what you see is that if you look at these two vectors, x and y, our data points, yeah, 
or, uh, uh, of uh, are two vectors, a basis function is also called, of, of A. If you calculate the rank and you look at each of these columns as a different vector, then what you see is that these two vectors, 1, 2, and 3, and 1, 1, 1, are linearly independent. You cannot go from one to the other with an easy scalar multiplication or by subtracting, adding, or whatever. That's obvious, yeah? These are two completely different vectors. They're linearly independent. So the rank of A is 2. So it's a full rank. Now what you do is that you then rank A and B jointly. So you add B to A. And what happens now is that now what you see is that you have three linearly independent vectors. This was B, yeah? this is A, and this was B. So what does this all mean? In the case that we rank A alone, we get a rank of two. Now we add B to A and our rank becomes 3. So that essentially means that this vector is linearly independent of the vectors in A, the two columns. Now that is disturbing because that means that if it's linearly independent, that means that we cannot perfectly describe B based on some linear combination and scalar multiplication, if needed, of the two columns of A. It doesn't exist. It, there is no perfect solution, because B is linearly independent of A. So what you see here is there is no perfect solution, and that's what you see. There is a solution, it just does not go perfectly through the data points. In our first example, with the piping, uh, uh, the pipe system, yeah, these were our data points. Oh, let's see where are we. Here, these were our data points here. Yeah, and now I can do rank of A. You see that's three, this was A. And if I add B to this, it remains three. So what does that tell you? That B is linearly dependent on, on the vectors in A. And that tells you that you can perfectly predict B from the information in A if you just use a scalar multiplication or some linear, linear combination on the, of the information in A gives you B. Now, and so you can predict B perfectly on the information in A. That's essentially what this says. The rank doesn't increase. So B is not linearly independent of A. Yeah? So the rank doesn't increase. So that tells you that there is a perfect solution. So there is no residual. Okay? <coughs> now, so here, so if you would calculate the residual for the first example, you would see that it's zero or really, really small, like, like uh, almost zero. But that's not perfectly zero because of some measurement error or so. But anyway, <coughs> virtually zero, not the values that we got. That means the system of equations is consistent. So look that up at home, okay? So this is important. So on page 375 of the book, please study that carefully. Page 375. Okay, here, this figure, figure 8.6, here. This is important. I suggest you study that because you can expect a question about this later on in the exam next week. Okay, I'll let you uh, um, look at that. And that's about consistency, uh, etc. Like, I try to summarize it here. So if A is an n by n matrix, does m rows and n columns, just to be clear, yeah? So that matrix A has m rows and n columns, that if the rank of A alone is smaller than the number of columns, and A times X is B has a solution, so you do the Gaussian elimination, you're going to get a solution, that might mean that you have an infinite number of solutions. So you do get a solution, MATLAB gives you a solution, but there's an infinite number of solutions. 
That means like what MATLAB gives you might be a solution, but there might be hundreds and thousands of other solutions. And you can figure it out because you can calculate the rank of that matrix. And you can figure out is uh, the solution you're getting. That's what summarized. I'm summarizing what's in the figures. Please study that. Now, alternatively, if the rank of A is equal to the number of columns, and A times X is B has a solution, then this is a unique solution. Okay? So in our case, remember, the rank of A for the pipe flow problem was 3. Now, that made sense because we had three data pairs, yeah, and the, the, the size of A was 3 by 3, so the rank is 3. So we have the second problem, line 250. The rank of, rank of A is N. And so we had a unique solution. The second problem with X and Y, the rank of A was 2. And so we're also over here because our matrix was 3 by 2. Yeah, in the second problem, remember, if we go back to the second problem here, we set up A here, let's see here, this was A. Yeah, so A is size 3 by 2, what is the maximum rank of this matrix? Yeah, now, so... Rank A is equal to the number of columns, 2, so this means that we have the second case, rank A is equal to N, so our solution that we got is a unique solution. So, um, so understand what consistency means, a system of equations is consistent, that will tell you that the model perfectly goes through the data points. So the, the coefficients will perfectly fit the data that you derive with Gaussian elimination, for instance, the backslash operator. Inconsistent means that it does not perfectly go through the data. You have a residual left. Now, and remember, please do not use the inverse of A. I'm not going to give you zero points if you use that. You're gonna, what, what we care about is that you get the right answer. So no matter how you do it, but I know that there's going to be students now that are going to use this, and we're going to use matrices that are not squared, and that's going to get an error warning. And then you don't know what to do anymore. I just use that because that's what you probably used maybe, or that makes mathematically sense. But the inverse of A times B is A backslash B. That's the same. But you do not really compute the inverse. It's causal elimination. So this line is similar to this. Okay, where C is X. I didn't like that the book uses A times X is B, so I'm forced to use X as in the book. I would have called it C for coefficients. So that's why you see X here as the coefficients, and you see C here, it's the same thing. I prefer C, but maybe they don't like A, B, C. The Jacksons or so, yeah, what's that? So we have uh, uh, now MATLAB, or there's also a nice script that, that I wrote for you that will show the caution. Oh, here, that's A and B. We need to, I need to have the A and B, the right A and B here. Here. So this is caution elimination. The book talks about this for a long time. You do not need to know the theory. What I care about is that you know how to solve this in practice. But this is a script that you have that shows how the Gaussian elimination works with the different steps, okay? And how it then ends up with the final solution. Okay, now, so what's important? Consistency, inconsistent, uh, uh, unique solution, infinite number of solutions, the backslash operator, A and B, and Wednesday will continue with two other ways to calculate the solution. So to solving a system of equations, we now talked about Gaussian elimination. On Wednesday, we will talk about factorization methods. Are we going to ask those? Not really, but the book covers them, so we will cover them. But most importantly, maybe on Wednesday, but certainly on Friday, we will go over a number of examples that you can expect on the second exam next week. Okay? And those that have questions, those that have students that have questions about what they did wrong, you can either talk to me or go to the TA and they will show it to you, okay?